All right, today I wanna to talk about statin drugs and the relationship to cholesterol and potential risk reduction in all-cause mortality, which is risk of death, um, re potential reductions in myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, and in stroke. And if you're someone with a cholesterol that's ever been tested by your conventional medical doctor and it came back over 200, you were probably told you should go on a statin drug despite the fact that in reality, they're supposed to recommend, quote, intensive dietary and lifestyle change for six months before implementing a statin, unquote. But that rarely ever happens, that recommendation. And so, you know, we have, I have patients coming in regularly who have been told they should go on statins and they wonder, should I? And the research as we've covered in multiple videos in the past just does not support the statement that statin drugs decrease all-cause mortality, heart attack, and stroke risk significantly enough to subject yourself to the potential side effects of uh, fatigue due to CoQ10 deficiency, of transient global amnesia, of joint pain, of muscle pain, of rhabdomyolysis and kidney damage, and various other issues. So to underscore this, a paper was just published in May of this year, 2022, in JAMA Internal Medicine, which is JAMA stands for the Journal of the American Medical Association. So, you know, the big journal from conventional medicine looked, ran a meta-analysis, which is basically a huge, a study that takes a bunch of other studies and combines them. So you statistically have huge numbers and can truly discover if there's a significant effect of whatever outcome you're studying. And so this paper by JAMA Internal Medicine, the title is Evaluating the Association Between LDL Cholesterol Reduction and Relative and Absolute Effects of Statin Treatment. So um, we'll scroll down here. <clears throat> so why is this important? Well, it's important because from a marketing perspective, you've heard for over 20 years that if you have high cholesterol, you need to take a statin drug or you're at increased risk of dying from heart attack or stroke. And that essential message has made this class of statin drugs the highest selling class of drugs of all time because people are buying into that. The problem is there's not data to support that statement. And so that money has been basically laundered from the American people. And after 20 plus years of statin use, the research shows that there's people are dying at the same rate of heart disease and stroke just with lower cholesterol, people who are on statins. So that would suggest that it's not cholesterol that, is, that they're dying from because their cholesterol was lowered by the drug. Uh, cholesterol wasn't the issue, but the sign of a deeper issue, right? So this, this paper's objective is to assess the association between absolute reductions in LDL levels with statin drugs and all-cause mortality, heart attack, and stroke risk. And the reason that they wanted to study this is because right here they say, quote, to facilitate shared decision-making between clinicians and patients and inform clinical guidelines and policy. Why is that important? Well, because when probably your experience in your GP's office is your, la your le yearly physical labs came back, your lipid panel comes back and they say, Jane, you have high cholesterol. You need to go on this drug or you're going to die of heart disease or stroke. And that's not shared decision making. That is basically someone hitting you over the head with a club and telling you to do something. But again, medically, we're legally required to give informed consent, which is made up of the benefits, risks, and alternatives to any and all therapies recommended. And again, as I said at the start, if they did not tell you, well, first you should try six months of intense dietary and activity change, lifestyle change, well, then they didn't give you full informed consent because that's an alternative and that's the recommended alternative actually. They of course told you the benefits or the perceived benefits and they didn't tell you the risks probably of, of muscle breakdown, of joint pain, of muscle pain, of loss of memory, of fatigue, etc. So this paper wants to ask the question, you know, address the elephant in the room so that we can facilitate shared decision making. So we can take the patient 
and put them back in the equation with the clinician in terms of what should care look like. So the data sources for this study range from studies, uh, clinical trials that were run between January 1987 to June 2021. So covering many, many years, let's see, what would that be? 1990 to 2020 is 30 years. So we're at about 34, 35 years of information. So the life of, of statin drug use, okay? And they use large randomized clinical trials that, have, that examine the effectiveness of statins in reducing LDL levels. So the main outcomes, here's what's important. The primary outcome they wanted to study was how does statin drug use to reduce LDL levels affect all-cause mortality? So affect your risk of death from any cause. And the secondary outcomes was how does statin use and associated lowering of LDL cholesterol affect heart attack and stroke risk? So those are outcomes that we want to know because those are the things they've been propagandizing us with. Now, another thing that's important to recognize is, um, where is it here? One second. They wanted to measure um, absolute risk reduction. Okay. And here's, here's why that matters. You have to understand absolute risk versus relative risk. And this is a statistical game that gets played all the time um, that can trick you. And it's, it's very insidious and, and it's very, um, say, malevolent because the average person doesn't know the difference between these things and hasn't taken statistics and you know, all of that. So here's where pharmaceutical companies can dupe us into thinking something works absolute risk versus relative risk. So if something, so absolute risk is if we're studying a drug, say, and we give it to a thousand people and we're looking at how the drug lowers risk of death versus how not taking the drug lowers risk of death. So if we have a thousand people and we have, you know, the drug, class, the drug group and we have the control group, or the placebo group, okay? I'll make it a C for control group. They didn't get care. And there's a thousand people in each group. Okay, so a thousand and a thousand. And if we give the drug to a thousand people and only two people out of the thousand die, then that's one outcome. And if the control group in the same period, four people die, that's another outcome. So in that case, in the um, control group, excuse me, uh, I lost my button here. So in that case, we can see that the absolute difference between uh, the drug group and the control group is two people, okay? only two less people died in the control group. And so when you use numbers on the level 1000, that's a risk, an absolute risk reduction of 0.2%. So if I said, hey, we have this new drug that addresses X disease that everyone's scared of and everyone's scared of dying from. And if you take this drug, it will decrease your risk of dying from that disease by 0.2%. Are you excited? right? How many of those drugs do you think I'll sell? Not much, right? Because, hey, that essentially is not decreasing your risk of death at all. Less than 1%, 0.2%, okay? But with statistics, we can make that look a lot sexier. With statistics, in the same groups, in the drug class, two people died. And in the control group, four people died. Well, if you look at the relative risk reduction there, the drug class had a 50% less deaths than the control group. So what the media does and the pharmaceutical companies do is they say, now you fear disease X, and if you don't want to die from it, well, we have this drug that can decrease your relative risk of death by 50%. Would you take it? And again, being a layperson that 
doesn't know statistics or know this information is like, well, yeah, if you're going to reduce my risk 50% of this thing, then maybe it's worthwhile for me to take it. Okay. And it's the same exact drug. It's the same actually effect, essentially useless drug. It really is only absolutely the absolute real world numbers reducing your risk 0.2%. But with statistics and, and magic, you know, they are going to communicate a 50% reduction. And this has happened with drugs throughout history. This has happened uh, since 2020 with new supposedly blockbuster technology that everyone's heard of before. They said it had a 95, 94, 95% of efficacy, nowhere near that. Okay. And so it's important to know about absolute risk versus relative risk. So let's go back to statins. Um, what does it look like for statins? What did this study find? So let's scroll down here and we can go through here and read. So 21 trials were included in this analysis. So 21 studies since 1987 were included. And when they look at the absolute risk reduction for all cause mortality from statin drugs, it came out to a whopping 0.8%, less than 1% reduction. When they looked at heart attack risk reduction from statin drug use, a whopping 1.3% absolute risk reduction. And then decrease of stroke risk with statin drugs, a whopping 0.4%, less than one half of 1%. The relative risk, if we take those same numbers, so all-cause mortality was absolutely reduced 0.8% on statins, but the relative risk was 9%. So 9% still isn't great, but it sounds better than 0.8%, okay? Heart attack, the absolute risk was 1.3%, but it's it would be communicated to you as 29% reduced risk of heart attack. That's almost a third, that might convince some people. And then the 0.4% absolute risk reduction in stroke worked out to a 14% relative risk reduction, okay? So you can see here that the numbers are not sexy and the numbers dependent, you know, the numbers probably don't justify you submitting yourself to the huge range of side effects that come along, potential side effects that come along with statins. So let's read the conclusions of these authors. The results of this meta-analysis suggest that the absolute risk reductions of treatment with statins in terms of all cause mortality, heart attack, and stroke are modest. Now, I don't even know where they get modest from because how is 1% or less a modest reduction? Modest to me would be like, hey, 30%, right? Mild would be 10% and anything above 50% would be blockbuster, right? But to call 1% modest is very, very generous. I don't think these numbers don't justify modest. But anyway, so they quote, Absolute risk reduction of treatment with statins are modest compared with the relative risk reductions and the presence of significant heterogeneity reduces the certainty of the evidence. So even this, these numbers you know, are uncertain because of heterogeneity between people studied and all of that stuff. So a conclusive association between absolute reductions in LDL and individual clinical outcomes was not established. These findings underscore the importance of discussing absolute risk reductions when making informed clinical decisions with individual patients. What does that mean? It means A, that 35 years of marketing on statins has been a lie, which we've known for a lot of that time. Um, but I just want to bring it forward to you today because here's the latest study from a huge journal from conventional medicine's you know, own journal. And then B, I wanted to show you the, how they played the statistical games and why, um, you know, there's the quote out there uh, that says there's lies, damn lies and statistics. This is one way that that quote has come true. And then lastly, to remind you that as the patient, you are part of the clinical decision-making and right now in our country, at least healthcare is a free market still. And so you don't have to be, uh, feared or abused or bullied or coerced into any clinical decision. What they're supposed to give you is informed consent and give you 
benefits, risks, and alternatives. And if they're not going to do that, if they're just going to bully you into something, then that's a sign you should run out of that office and never go back. And when they're recommending a treatment, again, like we've talked about in other videos, uh, you want to know, ask them, what are the absolute risk reductions for the outcome that is relevant in that conversation? And also ask them, like we talked about in other videos, what's the number needed to treat, the NNT? Because that matters. And as a reminder, the number needed to treat is how many people need to take a given drug for one person to be saved. So for example, for statins, the number needed to treat NNT for, for one person to be saved from a heart attack on statin drugs is 200. That's terrible. Okay, so 200 people need to be exposed to the side effects of statins for one person to be prevented of a heart attack. That's an absolutely awful number. So again, the data isn't good for statins. If you're looking for um, help reducing cholesterol, cholesterol is the canary in the coal mine. I've made other videos describing that, but cholesterol is the canary. For those who aren't familiar with that metaphor, in coal mines, if there's a carbon monoxide leak, the miners could die if they don't know about it because you can't smell carbon monoxide. So, you know, they they die before they realize it was there. But canaries do detect carbon monoxide. So if you bring a canary in a coal mine and there's a leak, the canary will die before the humans. So the humans could see that and say, we need to get out of here and we need to find that leak and deal with it. Well, cholesterol is the canary in the coal mine. Cholesterol is telling you, you are inflamed. It doesn't tell you why or where. You need to do further detective work to figure that out. But the, the cholesterol is telling you that. So if you go take a statin drug and you duct tape over the canary's beak, so to speak, and it's not chirping and before it dies to get your attention, well, then you might die, right, of the carbon monoxide leak, uh, leak just with lower cholesterol, right? So. Um, we don't want to kill, we don't want to stop the symptom from telling us there's an issue. You know, we don't want to, if we change metaphors, we don't want to duct tape over the check engine light. We want to see the check engine light and say, hey, I should run some diagnostics and look a little bit deeper and see why this check engine light is on. So I hope that helps. I hope that uh, is revealing to you and helps you become a better healthcare consumer, especially when it comes to pharmaceutical recommendations. And again, the absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction doesn't just apply to statins, it applies to vaccines, medications, you know, uh, any treatment that's being studied to look at risk. And so ask your doctor, um, what is the research saying about this therapy that you're recommending in terms of absolute risk reduction and what is the NNT? I do not, I have never had high cholesterol, um, but what are your concerns, you know, like if somebody's over 200, uh, what are you looking for? Um, and then, you know, what are, what are you going to do about it in, in, from a functional medicine perspective? Besides, you know, if somebody has the diet and they still have, you know, some high cholesterol, they, what, what, would you recommend? Yeah, uh, I'd recommend that you haven't found the cause of the high cholesterol. So if you, if you've, you know, say you find high cholesterol and um, you make dietary change and it doesn't change the cholesterol, then you address one possible reason that the cholesterol would be high. So it'd be, okay, good job that you did that, but there's still something driving cholesterol up from a non-dietary perspective in this case if everything's perfect and we truly did address the dietary part so we have to figure out what that is okay um make sense yeah okay and then to your i, I want i don't want to i'm not done with you i'm just i'm trying at the same time to look for a study to show you and answer your question at the same time uh because go ahead did you have a yeah and also well i've actually at when I was really sick, um, I had too low of cholesterol and I was, I mean, this is back in the nineties, probably earlier than that, but I was asking doctors, is there such a thing as too low of cholesterol? And they're like, no, the lower, the better. And I no. never believed it. 
and um, you know, I have people talk to me and oh yeah, my, like my sister, for example, I want my cholesterol. I felt really good at 145. I'm like, that's too low. Um, so can yeah. you, I don't know if that's a yeah. topic for a different day, if that's too no. much. No, it's, it's great. Um, if anyone's bored by the conversation, they don't have to listen, but this is all, these are all common questions that are really good. Um, so one, uh, to your point, whenever patients say, um, say patients, whenever patients are put on statins and, and say, cause some patients go on, right? Cause they don't know better. So they go on. Well, then the next question I have them ask their provider is we'll go back and ask them, what is the goal? What is the floor target for their cholesterol, right? If you're 200 or 219 and you're on a statin, ask them, well, how low do I want to go? Because zero, you know, you'll see the range less than 200. So does that mean I want zero? Is zero cholesterol physiologically logical? No, cholesterol is the steroid backbone for all of our sex hormones, all of our, uh, so your cortisol and your estrogen and your testosterone, and your progesterone. If you have no cortisol, you're not making those. Cortisol is needed for vitamin D synthesis. Cortisol is needed for um, CoQ10. Cortisol is needed for cellular repair. So we don't want zero. There's research showing that, um, especially in postmenopausal women, the lower you go below 200, the, the worse things get. The lower you go below 180, the very worse, you know, gets even worse. And below 150, your risk of breast cancer and type 2 diabetes skyrocket. So, you know, you need to ask the doctor if you're actually going to say yes to the statin, you need to ask the doctor, well, what is our goal here? And are we going to follow it? Because often it's, it's like, no, here, you're on this for the rest of your life. And we don't care what you get to. So I think if you look at your lab test, the range for cholesterol is zero to 200 is normal. Yeah, it depends on the lab. One, some yeah. will say zero to 200 or some will just have a less than 200, right? And so that's ridiculous because zero is, you'd be dead if you had zero, I promise. So again, you wanna ask, where do we want it? And you know, even if you don't have zero, but you have too low, if you're postmenopausal, I just gave you those stats, but then say you're not postmenopausal, say you're childbearing age. Well, to be fertile, you have to have a certain level of cholesterol so you can make those hormones, right? Or say you're just a person that's not worried about fertility, um, but you're really stressed out. Well, for you to adapt to stress, you have to have cortisol and to have cortisol, you have to have cholesterol. So we, we, can't, we can't have zero cholesterol. Um, and if you're taking statins to lower cholesterol, I've made a video in the past about all of the nutrient deficiencies uh, statins drive, including selenium and vitamin K2 and glutathione and CoQ10. So I'll refer you back to that. But then you asked about, well, what if you're, if you're, if you're above 200, where do you want to be, right? Well, here's a study that was done in 2019, looking at almost 13 million adults. So again, statistically massively significant. This was done in the journal Nature, which is the it, if it's not the highest, it's one of the highest rated journals on the planet in terms of impact rating, which is how they score them. And so they want to look at total cholesterol and all cause mortality by sex and age in 13 million people. And so, you know, what the marketing says is they do this. They say, whatever your total cholesterol level is and your risk of death, it looks like this right? The higher your total cholesterol, the higher your risk of death. That's what they tell you. We just saw that that's not true uh, indirectly, but now we can see it directly in this study of over 13 million people. It, it's not a linear curve like the one I just drew. It's actually U-shaped, especially when you get above age 35. Uh, there's prettier ones. Here we go. So Every from age 35 up every decade, it's a U shaped distribution in terms of your risk from uh, cholesterol. So, let me move myself all the way here. So, if you see here, age 35 to 44, the higher you go below, or the, the further you go below 200, the higher your risk of death. Okay, and the higher you go above. 240, basically, the higher risk of death. So the sweet spot if you're age 35 to 44 is about 220. That's golden. But in the US, the doctors will say, oh my gosh, you're going to die. You need to be on a statin. You need to be lower. 
below 200. Oh, really? How far below, doc? Because we're increasing our risk. And at this age group, you can see the blue line is men. Men's risk goes up big time as you go below 220. Okay, the women take a little while. You might see some improved risk down to 180, but then again, it starts to take off. Now, if we move up to 45 to 54 years old, women start, again, the risk starts to take off at about, call that 210-ish, right? And at 180, you know, 140, you're, you're, you're skyrocketing. And again, as you go up in age, the angle gets worse, okay? So what you can see is as we go up in age here, the angle gets worse and your risk of death gets worse going lower than going higher, right? So yeah, the risk of death is going up this way too, but look at the angle compared to this one. Going lower is the worst direction to go versus going higher as you age. And so if you average everybody, you know, all the decades, the sweet spot is actually about 220 across the 13 million people across all the decades that they studied. So, you know, then you, it begs the question, well, why the heck does the total cholesterol normal range continue to drop over the years? The only answer I can have for that is it's not based on data, right? It's gotta be based on, on uh, shareholders because, you know, there's no, there's no scientific or clinical support for what the normal range says. So if I know you were talking about high cholesterol, we all know dietary changes, you know, eat, don't eat a standard mm -hmm. American diet, more vegetables, more fiber. What about too low co cholesterol? What dietary changes are, can you do to make more cholesterol or do you have to do like liver, you know, cleanses or, you know, to, cause I know cholesterol is made in the liver, but yeah, yeah. Um, what are any suggestions there? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's some things you can do, but largely the part of the lipid panel that is most impacted by diet directly is going to be your triglyceride level. Um, and that's going to be tied to your, sh your sugar and carb intake and your insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance, depending on what's going on there. Um, you know, vitamin B5 is needed to make cholesterol. So like if you, if you see cholesterol and then you're feeding into the adrenal hormones, if you go a step back, vitamin B5 is, or panathenic acid is important for cholesterol production. So for the people who are low, understanding their, their B5 or panathenic acid levels could be important there. And so any foods that are um, higher in that would be potentially relevant to the conversation. Um, you also want to look at thyroid and hypothyroidism. A lower thyroid will drive cholesterol levels up. Okay. So if you have high cholesterol and that's all they ran and they didn't look at your thyroid, you know, then you're taking a statin and the real issue might be your thyroid suboptimal, right? So again, you're, you're getting all the risks of taking the statin and still not addressing the actual issue right? The, the, the high cholesterol is the canary or the check engine light saying, look elsewhere, maybe it's your thyroid. And you're saying, oh, shut up, duct tape over you, right? Um, whereas if you were, say, hyperthyroid, you may have lower cholesterol, right? The inverse. So um, thyroid is something to consider with cholesterol issues. Any inflammation, uh, a very common driver of high cholesterol is high homocysteine or methylation issues. And so I've, I've communicated to patients before, the cholesterol is, um, well, say you, you're having a party at your house, okay? And at every party, there's always a friend who's a drunk idiot and he's punching holes in your drywall, right? At least college parties, right? So, you know, that, that idiot gets too drunk, he punches holes in your drywall. Well, tomorrow you wake up and you have to patch the drywall because you don't want to pay the landlord you know, more money. So you have to hire a, a handyman. Well, cholesterol is that handyman. Cholesterol and LDL specifically is that handyman. LDL leaves the liver and goes out to the body to patch drywall. Okay. HDL goes from the body and takes leftover drywall and brings it back to the liver to be metabolized. Okay. So if you have that party and that idiot punches holes in your drywall, 
and you have the handyman over and your, your roommate comes in and says, what are you doing here? And tackles the handyman and kicks him out of the house. Then the, the holes never get patched, right? That your, your roommate last night should have tackled the drunk idiot and kicked him out of the house. And then you don't have holes in your drywall. The holes in the drywall maybe are holes in your vasculature. So then you have a hemorrhagic stroke, right? Or a heart attack that way or, or throw a clot. So really homocysteine is that drunk idiot. All right, so we'd rather tackle homocysteine than tackle LDL, who's actually, again, doing your body smart. LDL isn't bad, okay? HDL isn't good. They should be in a certain ratio. So if LDL is high, we don't want to say that's bad, tackle him. We want to say, well, why are there holes in our drywall that need to be patched, right? So we need to go a step further and say, is homocysteine around? Is uh, CRP around? You know, what are, what, what are the other inflammatory markers doing, especially ones related to cardiovascular um, health or lack of cardiovascular health and tackle those guys. And if I tackle homocysteine or I don't invite him to the party next time, I don't have to call the handyman tomorrow, right? So, if, you know, when you found it, because if you said earlier, like, what if diet doesn't work? Well, what if you change your diet, but you, you have a MTHFR SNP that increases homocysteine regardless of your diet, right? You didn't tackle the right guy. So you know if you tackle the right guy because the cholesterol will come down or equilibrate in your system to where it needs to be if, you, if, if we nailed it in that case. Make sense? So uh, One good. other question. Sorry, I'm, I'm like asking all these questions. Um, no, it's, it's good. So how much, how much cholesterol raising comes from diet like eggs were egg mm. yolks were demonized yeah. um you know very high very, cholesterol foods were yeah were demonized. almost none um i mean if you it, it's interesting because like you said eggs were demonized red meat were demonized bacon's demonized um and so here recently, the last couple of years, the carnivore diet has, has become popular. And I've got multiple patients that have been on the carnivore diet for months to years that I've had their labs pre and into carnivore and on. And I, every single one of them have beautiful lipid panels, which conventional medicine would like, you know, say you're crazy to do that or I'm a quack for letting you do that or whatever, which I'm not letting you do anything, right? It's a free market. Um, so, you know, the, that, that whole myth has been busted multiple times. And again, if red meat, like if you've read the China study, there's a bunch of problems with the China study. Um, if you see, you know, red meat clogs arteries or causes heart attacks, well, red meat doesn't clog arteries. And if red meat causes a heart attack, we have to take the step back and say, well, what kind of red meat were you eating? Were you eating red meat that was inflamed while the cow lived on a, on a feed lot in Kansas and never walked and ate food it wasn't supposed to eat? So it had an inflamed physiology, which you then ate. You know, its physiology was omega-6 dominant, which is pro-inflammatory. Or did you eat a grass-fed cow that was in the sun, in the grass, and had a, an omega-3 biased physiology, which then will provide you with omega-3 meat which is anti-inflammatory heart attack risk reducing, you know? So you are what you eat, but you are what you eat eats too. There's multiple steps backwards. Um, and so to bottle that up or button that up, it's sugar is the biggest, I mean, sugar is the real enemy. And if you, sugar is what's gonna jack up your cholesterol level directly via say a triglyceride insulin sensitivity standpoint, and then knock up your total cholesterol and LDL via its effects on inflammation and the results of the inflammation that way. So good questions. What else? Well, do you mind if I continue? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've, I know people and I used to, you know, counsel people who have, um, they go to renowned cardiologists, tell them you have to be vegan mm -hmm. because you have all these uh, heart issues. You know, person had a heart attack. Um, and, and then one patient in particular started eating soy based Italian beef, so, you know, all the, the, the yeah. vegan. I'm like, so I, I 
but his sodium was high. And of course he had high blood pressure. And I'm like, no, you can't eat that. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are your thoughts on a strictly plant-based diet for heart issues and cholesterol? Um, I'm, I'm not for a strictly plant-based diet, um, uh, period. Um, so whether we're talking about heart and cholesterol, or we're talking about a walls protocol for MS, or we're talking about, um, you know, whatever, um, you know, unless there are individual circumstances, um, you know, physiologically that dictate that. I'm, I'm not for that. And I haven't, I haven't seen individual circumstances that dictate that. So um, where people that I've worked with have stayed completely vegetarian um, or vegan, that it was because of, you know, a, a philosophical reason, you know, so you're entitled to have that, but it, you know, those people I even say, it's like, Hey, you know, we can get, they're faster with better raw materials, you know? So even if you don't want to actually eat a steak, will you do, would you do a beef protein powder, you know, or would you do a collagen powder? Or would you do, you know, so can we get something in there because there's just benefits to that stuff that you're not getting from, from the vegan vegetarian way. And, and on the flip side, the many vegans and vegetarians are really grainitarians. So you have to be careful, you know, to, if you're doing that, then your cholesterol is going to be high because you're just crushing rice, thinking that you're healthy because you're not eating meat and eggs, you know. What else? I think I'm done. <laughs> so anybody else now? <laughs> Anyone else have some here? Bring it, Michelle. We know that my cholesterol is high um, and we're talking inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of go, I guess, along with these questions that she's asking and I'm listening you know, to the dietary things or whatnot, are there any specific foods that maybe I shouldn't be eating? If I'm doing like healthy, low carb, carb cycling, so it's mostly vegetables, some fruit, eggs, red meat. No. Okay. So then we'll just go on to our next step. Yeah. Okay. Unless in that, you know, where you could clean that up would be, in your case, would be, are, is the red meat I'm eating as clean as it could be, right? Breastfed. Yeah, right. Or are the eggs as clean as they could be or... You know, is the salmon I get once in a while wild caught versus farm raised? I mean, those would be those would be the nuances where the inflammation could be sneaking in, even though the diet itself looks ancestral. You know, okay. so um, and there's you know there's there's potential depending on the person, the family size, and all that. There's potential financial limitations to I can't do everything organic and everything grass fed and all mm -hmm. that. That's fine. You know, more non-organic veggies is better than no veggies right so there's certain trade-offs to be made there but in an ideal world you know if diet was your only focus which it shouldn't be because there's many other factors but mm -hmm. the way you could clean that up more is if those th boxes aren't checked should i look at maybe taking out like um, a protein powder that would have stevia in it could that be causing issues i'm not aware of uh, stevia impact on cholesterol Okay. Doesn't mean there isn't one. I just haven't thought to. Like that's the only that. sugar thing that I would have in my diet. So. Oh. Yeah, that's not. No, that's not gonna. If you're worried about triglycerides and things going up from stevia, from a protein shake here or there, no, you're fine. Okay. What about like food sensitivities that yeah. can cause inflammation? Yeah. So that that that's a good question and a good point and and again. That is more the inflammatory response though than the food, right? So like the food itself intrinsically isn't driving up the cholesterol per se. It's the individual's unique Action. immune response to the food, which results in inflammation, which if chronic can lead to lots of holes in drywall, so to speak. So yeah, finding out which foods are driving that reaction. And even more importantly, how has the immune system gone dysfunctional to be responding to those foods that way and addressing that? 
uh, would be the primary issue in that case.